What's up guys? Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and Mom24. Today, the day I am filming this, we hit 250,000 subscribers. My mind is blown. That is a quarter of a million people. I don't even know what to say. I have a special little celebratory video, totally not in the typical style of my videos, rewind through the past year, and a little thank you from me to you. Today's video is an episode of Netflix Sex Explained on birth control. You guys have sent this to me over and over and over, so I wanted to go through it, reframe some of the statistics, talk a little bit about some of the information right after this. Hi, Mom and Dr. Jones from the future. I filmed most of this video with a giant piece of black bean in my tooth. I refuse to refilm it. I'm going to post a video of myself with food in my tooth almost the whole time. I'm sorry, I'm just a person. Let's watch this. We're not sure why this shape became the universal symbol of love, but one leading theory is that it came from the Silphium pod. So valuable across the ancient Mediterranean, it was printed on the currency of the only place they grew the Greek colony, Cyrene, advised women to drink silphium juice once a month, since it not only prevents conception, but also destroys any already existing. Oh, that was super interesting. So that was a little run through uh, historical birth control way, 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 way long ago in what is now, I think, modern day Libya. Birth control was a lot less refined. There were early condoms made of animal intestines that were washed and reused. In diaphragms, early versions were just women putting various things up their vaginas. Wool, silk, crushed plants, or animal dung. We'll never know for sure how well silphium worked because it went extinct. But research into its likely relatives, like Queen Anne's lace and devil's dung, suggests it probably manipulated the hormone levels involved in getting pregnant. I don't know a lot about this, but I do know that there are some theories out there that the reason it went extinct is because people were so desperate for something that could prevent pregnancy that they basically picked it into extinction and used it into extinction. That was kind of a historical theory about that area of the world as well. So yeah, kind of interesting. If you have a pet cat, well, you may remember when she started going into heat. As in when she started ovulating producing eggs. And for those few days when they're fertile, they really want to mate. Most female mammals look and act different around the days they're ovulating, called estrus, signaling that they want it. So come and get it. I am a human gynecologist and I really am not interested in watching animals humping today. Can we move on? We don't show outward signs that it's our fertile few days of the month. And we're continually receptive to sex whether we're fertile or not. Scientists call this concealed ovulation. And it took them into the 1900s to figure out how it worked. I think this is still kind of a contentious point among scientists with a large majority of the research actually saying there are some at least behavioral receptiveness to sex changes that go on in both the person who is ovulating and the interested party. So there is some body of evidence that we potentially act different during the time frame of ovulation. Which rise and fall over the course of a month. Two of them are released from the brain and two come from the ovaries, estrogen and progesterone. Then the follicle ruptures, releasing the matured egg, which is snatched up by the nearby fallopian tube. The sperm has a short window of time to get to the egg or it dies off. But if one gets there, that's fertilization. That fertility window is interesting, right? A sperm can live for about five days after ejaculation. An egg can only live about 12 hours unless it gets fertilized after ovulation. So the fertile window is generally the five days prior to ovulation, maybe half a day or a day after ovulation, but not significantly after that. If a fertilized egg does successfully implant, that's a pregnancy. Estrogen and progesterone levels stay high and the ovaries won't release more eggs. Hormonal birth control's main cheat is altering the estrogen and progesterone levels in the body. So it thinks you're already pregnant. So no new eggs are released. The cervix stays plugged up and the uterine lining remains thin. The hormonal changes are kind of similar to pregnancy, but you're not not ovulating 
when you're on a birth control pill because your body thinks it's pregnant. The body doesn't think anything. This is a feedback loop. So this is simply all the different systems that go into that axis that we talked about in the last video relating to each other, the current level of hormones and doing their job based on the current level of hormones. I just don't like that phrasing. It implies that your body is confused and your body is not confused. It's appropriately responding to the hormone levels that are present to do exactly what we are trying to do with that birth control pill, which is keep you from ovulating and keep you from getting pregnant. And while the risk is extremely small, estrogen increases the chances that your blood will thicken into a clot which can travel to your lungs and block blood flow, which can be lethal. In that first pill, it contained 10 times the amount of hormones needed to be effective. It's a risk benefit discussion. The risk of major side effects is very low, but not zero. I always tell my patients, if you're having a side effect, I wanna know about it so that we can decide, do we need to change your pill? Do we need to give you a different dose of the same pill? Do we need to stop the pill altogether? Or do we need to just wait and see if that improves with time, depending on how that person feels about how much benefit they're gaining from being on the medication itself. That high dose was primarily tested in Puerto Rico in the 50s. Chosen because it was poor and the US government worried about its overpopulation, the U.S. appointed governor endorsed a sterilization program. By 1954, sterilizations had nearly tripled, the women often coerced. So when researchers arrived with a reversible birth control option, these women took it. But they didn't know that they were a part of an experiment until a documentary filmmaker told them decades later. I don't even know what to say. That is clearly appalling. Um, I didn't know that piece of historical information and that also is kind of appalling to me. That is nowhere near how research is done now and that is completely and totally unethical. Not that I have to tell anybody that. We know that just by listening to that story. That just breaks my heart. I don't know what else to say. That's terrible. For the U.S. Congress to finally hold a hearing on their side effects. Women experiencing heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and cancer. Thousands had died or been injured in the U.S. alone. For the first five days of the hearing, the all-male panel only invited men to testify. So the women, they invited themselves. An outburst by a group of young women today temporarily halted the Senate hearing on the safety of the birth control pill. Post-marketing surveillance on medications is very different now, and this, I would assume, is part of the reason. This just blows my mind, right? Like it's, we've come so far and this is in 50 years. That's incredible. The doses of hormones in the pills were lowered in the following years. A lot of potential side effects still remain, but for hundreds of millions of women around the world, not getting pregnant is worth making yourself a little sicker. I don't really like the way they phrased it. Some people don't feel more sick on birth control pills. Some people actually feel a lot better on birth control pills. And some of the things they list as side effects can also have a flip side of reducing that as a side effect, like making it better when you're on the pill. So for some people, acne is greatly improved by being on a pill. So this isn't just a, we need to have a full discussion about the risks. We also need to have a full discussion about the benefits because at the end of the day, you're not just looking at the risks. The risks aren't worth it if there's no benefit. We're looking at the risks and comparing them to the benefit. This is what I'm trying to convey here and anytime I talk to someone about birth control, this is medicine. Medicine is not black and white, risk, benefit. One of those synthetic forms of progesterone, DRSP, was a key component in a pill called YAS, which was heavily marketed in the 2000s as way more than just birth control. Yaz is the only birth control proven to treat the emotional and physical premenstrual symptoms that are severe enough to impact your life. It can also help keep your skin clear. Yaz contains a different kind of hormone that may increase potassium. Yaz was marketed in exactly the way they just said. However, those are not just like pulled from the air claims. The kind of medication that Yaz includes does have a better profile for improving acne and for treating PMDD and just general PMS symptoms. So it's not that they just made all of that up. It is more effective for those things. Then reports of side effects started to spread. From blood clots to organ failure to stroke, thousands of women say they got sick after taking a birth control pill called Yaz. Birth control pills roughly tripled the risk of getting blood clots. 
but studies later found that DRSP can as much as triple that risk. We need to reframe a little bit of this. What they're talking about with the blood clots, that also true. I do, however, take issue with the way that it was just presented, which is the way that it's always presented in the media. It wouldn't make for a clickbaity headline in the way I'm about to give it to you. The risk of a blood clot in someone who's not on any kind of birth control is around three in 10,000. Really, really low. Three people out of 10,000 people will get a blood clot. The risk for someone on a combined oral contraceptive, so hormones with estrogen and progesterone, is about five in 10,000. And someone on the Yaz birth control has a risk of about nine in 10,000. So yes, it doubles or triples your risk from three to nine in 10,000 people. If that was the only benefit of the medication, well, then clearly we wouldn't use it. But there are other benefits to that type of progesterone that is associated with this. And in some people, that benefit is way higher than that risk. And that's only something that the person and their physician can jointly discuss and decide. But for the most part, that is still an extraordinarily low risk of getting a DVT. And that's not even the risk of dying from it. That's the risk of it happening. If you want to like frame that into real life, the risk of not being on any birth control is pregnancy. And the risk of getting this type of complication while you're pregnant is about 20 in 10,000 during the pregnancy and about 65 in 10,000 in the postpartum period. So that's way higher than the risk with Yaz, but nobody's going around saying your risk is, you know, 20 or 30 or more times higher if you're on no form of birth control and happen to get pregnant, that's not how anyone swings it because that's not a good headline. View statistics for what they represent. It's really easy to change any statistic to look alarming. And I'm not implying we shouldn't be talking about this. It's super important. At the same time, it's not so important that when I send a script for Yaz in a patient who's been counseled in my office, the pharmacist should scare them out of picking it up. Getting your tubes tied is a more invasive procedure which blocks or cuts the fallopian tubes. The IUD is as effective and can be taken out, but only 12% of American women using birth control have one. And that's largely because of a huge class action lawsuit against one IUD, the Dalkin Shield. So yeah, anytime we talk about IUDs, you guys always say in the comments, that there are X, Y, Z number of options in other countries. When I say there's only two here and there's several types of progesterone ones, but we only have the T-shaped progesterone and the T-shaped copper one. And this is largely because of the Dalcon Shield. We now have very, very, very different ways of approving IUDs and all drugs, honestly, largely because of the Dalcon Shield. But it wasn't the fish bait shape that caused problems for people who got the Dalcon Shield, like Loretta Ross. My first two or three years with it were fine, but then I started developing very low-grade infections. None of the treatments worked, and six months later... I lapsed into a coma one night. When I woke up, I had a total hysterectomy. The Dalcon Shield had a design flaw. Its braided string was too thick, and it acted like a ladder for bacteria to climb into the uterus. What they're explaining is that the string, which hangs out of the cervix, was very thick, and it allowed bacteria to grow on that and move up into the uterus. And when that happens, there was a low level of bacteria. If that just stays there, then people are uncomfortable and they have side effects and bleeding and pain and it's not good. But if it gets into the blood, it can be life-threatening. And that's what she's talking about is that it got into her blood and she was septic. They had to remove her uterus because that was the source of the infection in order to save her life. And that would be something that is incredibly unlikely to happen with current IUDs because of the technology that's gone into developing them. Testing for these is extremely rigorous in the United States now, as it should be and as it should have been back then. But as we already know from the other historical information in this video, there was a lot of unethical things that went into getting a drug on the market in the 70s and earlier. The IUDs on the market now are extremely safe. The most common drawback? Horrible to get put in. Excruciating pain. Every birth control option has a drawback. 
which is why a third of American women have tried five or more kinds. I've been on three different types of the pill. I tried an IUD and now I'm getting an arm implant. I think a lot of this can be helped just by good counseling and by listening to people when they say they're having a side effect. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how likely the side effect is. If someone feels like their medication is causing the side effect and there's other options, and they want to switch, we should switch. So a good open conversation about every birth control is not great for everyone. Every birth control is not terrible for everyone. We need to try one based on what your goals are right now and give it a little while to start working and for your body to adjust and then reevaluate. What I see happening a lot of times is people having all of these side effects and they're either made to feel like they can't come in and talk about it or they don't have access to come in and talk about it or they just don't come in and talk about it because they think they have to put up with it or people in the clinic just don't listen to them and think it's not actually happening. That's not okay because most people who want to be on contraception can find an option that they are happy with. It may take time and it may take a few tries of different kinds, but we usually can make a good impact here. There is actually a birth control pill that doesn't use hormones. It was launched as Saheli, and it's been on the market for almost 30 years. Its active ingredient is what's called a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Not estrogen, but a compound that acts on estrogen receptors in the uterus. But good luck getting Saheli outside of India. That's where it was invented and went through the large human trials most countries require to market a drug. I had to look this up because I know what a selective estrogen receptor modulator is, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of those and we use them for a lot of different things, but not for contraception. I looked it up to see what is this one and why is it not in use anywhere except India. The reason that it's not released in the US is because it has a slightly lower effectiveness rate than traditional forms of birth control. If you are releasing a medication that's primary goal is prevention of pregnancy and you can't prove that it's equally as good as what we already have or better, then the FDA won't allow you to make money selling that to people. Nobody would sign up, I would think, for that trial if they're being told this doesn't work as well as contraception that we have currently available and we don't really know for sure what the side effects are yet. You're always looking at the primary reason it's being put out there and it needs to be as good as what we have in order to be considered as an option. Does that make sense? That's the reasoning behind that. Chinese have developed what they say is a safe and effective birth control pill for men. Pill. Male birth control may be one step closer to becoming a reality. But it never arrived. Since trials were often cut short, because men face too many side effects, side effects that might sound familiar like mood swings, acne, and a loss of libido. When approving a drug, the FDA weighs its risks against the risks of not taking that drug. And men, unlike women, don't personally face the risks that come with pregnancy and childbirth, like blood clots. I see this talked about a lot, and, and I think it's always made out to be that the men in the study complained too much, so it wasn't released, but that's not really how it works. They report side effects, there's ways of doing this, and you have to compare it to the risk of being on nothing, which in a man is your baseline risk, but in a person who can get pregnant, it's the risk of becoming pregnant, which carries, as I discussed a little bit earlier, way higher risks of basically everything that birth control increases your risk of. It's hard to get that through the FDA with the same side effect profile as contraceptive that we currently have available. The other side of this, at least in my opinion, is that I think most people who can get pregnant would hesitate to rely on a partner who is an inconsistent partner or a casual partner on their words saying that they were on something that would prevent pregnancy because the side effect of getting pregnant often largely falls on them. It would be greatly beneficial to people who don't wanna be bamboozled into having a baby when they didn't want it, but I don't know that it would like decrease the need for female birth control significantly. Does that make sense? The kind that has the best shot at approval right now doesn't use hormones. It's a non-surgical vasectomy. It works by injecting a gel into that sperm carrying tube where it stays killing sperm as they leave the testicles. A second shot is in development that would break down the jail. It's awaiting approval in India, 
where early trials have shown it's 98% effective, has no major side effects, and can last over a decade. Guys had the option to, to sort of take that level of responsibility, like leveling up from just using a condom. I think that would make it a fairer conversation. It takes two people to accidentally get pregnant. Absolutely, yes, 100%. I agree with that statement. I would probably personally always want to protect myself. I have to be responsible for my own shit. At the end of the day, if something did happen, the consequences would lay on me. And most women around the world see the consequences of an unplanned pregnancy as so serious that the choice is easy. Which is why in the United States, more than two thirds of partnered women use birth control. That was really good. I think we got some good information about history, about birth control, about how people can reframe statistics to make them work for their headlines. If you guys aren't following the Not So Fast campaign that Lindsay DeFranco just launched, you need to do that. They have this great mission and vision of giving people the tools they need to better interpret information that they are given online. I think they are largely targeting adolescents and teens and young adults, but this is such an important conversation for everyone. I love what they're doing. I'm not affiliated with them. I would be affiliated with them if they wanted me to be, but I'm not, I just think they're awesome. Thanks for being here today. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time. and subscribe. Also, if you're still out there watching, that means you liked the video, so give it a like and subscribe and stuff. Bye.